that's when the fighter is so focused and nervous and, and tense, strategizing, and just all about, the, everything's about them. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, episode 176, and thanks for tuning in. Today we hear from Mr. John Hackelman, a Kaju Kembo practitioner and instructor, as well as a legend in the world of MMA. Here at Whistle Kick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder of Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists in an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at headquarters, upcoming show guests, and even some product discounts. Some time ago, I told you about a book and course we released to help you hold the best martial arts events possible. The course is out, the book is out, and it's time to step up your events. Find the print and digital versions of the book on Amazon, and the course is available at KarateTournamentBook.com. No, it's not just for tournaments, and it's not just for karate. The book and course will help you make the most of any martial arts event you put on, guaranteed. You don't have to go far into the world of mixed martial arts to hear of today's guest. Mr. John Hackelman has built a career out of training some of the best in the world, and in the process, his facility, the pit, has become legendary. The man some call the pit master is more than a great coach. He has a foundation in Hawaiian Kempo and has some great stories, great perspectives on what it means to be a martial artist. Let's welcome him. Mr. Hackelman, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Looking forward to talking about everything that we're going to talk about today. The listeners will, you know, we're going to, we're going to get into some names. We're going to get into some stuff. People are going to hear some things that will raise some eyebrows, and I'm looking forward to that. But before we go forward, we need that context, who you are, how you got started, because that's how we're going to understand your path. So how did you get started as a martial artist? Let's see. Um, I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm in grade school hearing about um, this kill Howley day thing. Howley's what they call white people in Hawaii. Um, and I hear when I get to intermediate school or junior high school, it gets really rough. Um, so I want to learn how to fight because I don't want to, I don't want to get beat up and I don't want people to take my lunch money. So at like 10 years old, I go through the yellow pages, which they had back then actual books. And I looked through, through a bunch of them and I found one. I liked the logo. Um, so I found out where it was called caught the bus there. I actually had to catch two buses. I had to transfer. Uh, I walked into a place called Godin School of Self-Defense, which is a Hawaiian Kempo, a Kaja Kempo school. Uh, 404 P.E. Koi for you guys that live in Hawaii, right across from the Ala Moana Shopping Center. Um, I go upstairs into a tiny room about maybe 500 square feet. Uh, walk into an office where there's a big, bald, intimidating-looking guy. And, um, I started classes. I gave them what it was. I think it was $15. I forgot what it was a month, but I gave him a $15 check that my mom had given me. And that was the last check I ever gave him. He never charged me again. Um, and I just felt at home when I walked in that gym, I felt at home and I started training there and that was 1970. And I stayed with him um, until he passed away in nineteen or 2001. Um, he was there. He promoted me to black belt. He promoted me to 10th degree black belt. He promoted. He was there when I promoted Chuck uh, to black belt. Um, so he was around for a while and uh, he was part of the pit as well. He loved the pit. He loved what I created and. 1985, he thought it was the greatest thing in the world. He wished he did it. Um, and he was supporting, supporting me all the way. And boom, that was it. That's how I started martial arts. I never did anything else, really. 
um, no other sports, no other uh, real hobbies or activities. And uh, from 1970 till today, martial arts has been my life. Pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's boring at all. And I don't think the listeners are going to find that boring. Anyone that has dedicated their life to martial arts has great stories. And we're going to talk about all those great stories. And, you know, I, I know some bits and pieces, but I'm sure you're going to go way deeper than the stuff that I know. But I'm curious, you know, you started really young and you put a lot of effort in. I mean, taking two buses. I mean, maybe that wasn't a big deal for you, but, you know, kids today would not take two buses unless it was something they were super interested in. So what what was it that really grabbed you and kept you? Because I think that's the important part. You didn't waver, or maybe you did briefly, but you, you've been doing it continuously for a very long time. Uh, once I walked in that gym, I never wavered. I never didn't go. I, I I could be exaggerating, but I'll say I went six days a week. I mean, and and I'm sure there was a day here and a day there when I didn't go. But I, I put my gi in my little Pan Am bag, and I caught the bus, the t two buses I transferred. Uh, I would actually... Uh, Transferred on Wailai Avenue to the PE Koi bus. Uh, it, it didn't waver. It just it wasn't even it wasn't even something I loved doing or didn't love doing. It just it was what I did. It was like as soon as I did, it, I knew that's what I was going to do, and it, there was nothing else. I mean, it's like I mean it was, to me, it was it was like brushing my teeth every day. Only I didn't really love brushing my teeth. It's just something I just just got in and did, you know, and, and I don't know, I never looked back. I never thought of myself as anything but a martial artist from that day. Uh, it changed my life. It made me all kind of things, good and bad. And, uh, yes, yeah, I just caught those two buses. I, I had a great mom. I have a great mom, great dad. Um, I didn't, I'll never say anything bad about either one of them. Uh, but I and I don't think this is weird, but a lot of people do, including my wife now thinks it's she can't even believe it. I don't think my mom ever even came to the gym once. I, I just don't think even at that age, it's just like maybe it was a different era back then. But I, she never came and watched me train. She never like we now I have a I have a gym. Almost every mom, every almost student has a parent there watching them. And it's like even at like 12, 13, whatever. I don't think my mom ever came and I never thought that was weird. She was a great mom. I mean, when I got home, there was always dinner and my room was always clean and the sheets were always clean and, but she just never came and watched. So I, I don't know. I just, it's just something that was my thing after school being come home, get my gi, put it in my Pan Am bag, boom, catch a bus. And then when I turned like 14 and a half, when we started driving in Hawaii, uh, I would drive there every day. So, do do you it. think she did? I mean, you said she knew it was your thing. Do you think there was something in there where she felt you had to do it on your own? I don't think so. I mean, just I, I, I surfed a little bit too, and she never came and watched me did that. Do that. I don't know. It wasn't. I mean, and it's not like a spectator sport. Like if I fought, she can't. She did come to a couple of my fights, you know. So that's. But I mean, how many parents go to? I don't like if they play a sport, do they go to their practices and watch too? I don't know. I, I guess they do a lot of parents. I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing to, if they do go, I don't think it's showing more support or less support if they do go or don't go. Um, mine didn't. And I, I always felt total support by my mom and dad who were divorced, but I felt total support by both of them. She just, neither one of them just came to watch me train. So I, I don't know. I didn't really dissect it and, and, and try to, you know, get into it that much into the psychology of it. But no, she was, she never came and I never expected her to. All right. Here on martial arts radio, it's about stories. You know, martial artists have great stories. What we do just seems to lend itself to dramatic things happening, whether they're good or maybe not so good with your career you could probably, you know, talk to us for a week straight with the stories that you've had. But I'd like you to take a moment and tell us your favorite martial arts story. Yeah, that's that is absolutely impossible. I could pick 
I could pick one of my favorites, but I, okay, there's, that's fair. Okay, uh, um, I'll I'll go with um, I'm going to go help a good friend of mine, uh, Laborio, um, Ricardo Laborio. Um, I'm going to give two and two half ones. That's fine. And um, and uh, Ricardo Laborio is a good friend of mine. He he ran he ran uh, American Top Team. Um, probably the most prolific fight team in the world. Um, that and Jackson's are the two top ones um, as when it comes to numbers and, and quality of, of, of fighters. But anyway, so we're, we're really close and we're, we train together and work, work together. And he had a fighter. He wanted me to help him in the corner with Matt Brown or Mike Brown, Mike Brown. And he was fighting, I think he was fighting Uriah Faber. It was in it was in Sacramento. Uh, it was for the like the WEC Championship, uh, World Extreme Cage Fighting. That was before they became part of the UFC. Um, and Laborio had a long history of lower back problems. He had extreme. I mean, you could watch him. He didn't even say a word, but you could just watch him stand up and the way he walked. You could see his face. You knew he was. He couldn't. He was having a really, really bad day. Um, we're in the dress room getting ready for Mike Brown to go fight for the title, the world title. I mean, the world title. He's, he's fighting Uriah Faber. I mean, and that's when the fighter is so focused and nervous and and intense and and just you know strategizing and just all about the, everything's about them. I mean, you get them water, you go run, do them this. And, you know, it's all about them. I mean, they're about to go in the cage and fight or the ring, you know. But Laborio's back was bugging him. And and Mike could see that too. So instead of warming up like a, a normal fighter and stressing over himself and focusing on his whatever was going to go on in his, you know, in his life, the biggest thing ever, you know, at, at least, you know, in his, his professional life. Um, Laborio's, he could tell how bad Laborio's back was hurting. So he had Laborio lay on the, lay on the, uh, the bench in the dressing room. This is right before he goes out to fight. He knew Laborio had to walk out with him and his back was hurting. So he's massaging Laborio's back. Ricardo Laborio, this is Mike, Mike Brown, before he goes out to fight. He's actually rubbing his back, his trainer's back, before he goes out to fight. I mean, I was I was standing there and like going, "Well, uh, wait, what, what are you doing?" I didn't I didn't get the whole picture at first because I was running around doing other things. I had like two other fighters fighting that night, but then I just I zeroed in on it and I, I realized this is a sorry, this is crazy. This is a guy that's going to go out and fight for a world title against one of the toughest fighters of all times, Uriah Faber, and he's more worried about his trainer's back pain than his own life experience he's about to go create for himself. Then he went out and beat Uriah. He went out and beat Uriah that, that night. But I'll never forget what he did for his fighter, for, for his own, for his coach. That was one of the, I never forgot that story. He knows about it. He knows how I feel about that story. And he's like, okay, I've heard it a hundred times. So anyway, that's that would probably be my um that would probably be my number one story, even though it wasn't as closely related to my fighters or you know, just you know, it's people I really care about in, in the martial arts world, you know, Mike Brown and 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 uh Ricardo Laborio. So anyway, that's probably my favorite story. There's a lot of love in that story. Love, yeah, yeah. You know, from, just... from me, from me to them, and them to each other, and I'll never forget that story. Uh, probably the second one. I'll just make a real short one. When Court McGee won the Ultimate Fighter, um, it wasn't really a long story, but the fighter he beat, um, uh, Chris, uh, is, um, um. Just the way he reacted after Court beat him, um, he realized how much it meant to Court 
and he actually hugged Court. It's really weird. He was hugging Court. He was as happy as Court because he was so happy that Court was happy. It was really bizarre. He just lost his fight, but he's sharing in the in the uh, in the um, you know in the celebration that Court is because he realized how happy Court was, and I mean he just lost. You know, but but he it was it was unbelievable the way he was hugging Court and wiping his tears away. Court's tears. It was that was that was right up there. That was that was another one that that was like I'll never forget. So it know, says a lot about his character. Yeah, it said it it was it was it was unbelievable. And and, and it said a lot about Court, you know, because that's the way people felt feel not felt that's the way people feel about uh court mcgee court mcgee is um like a lot like chuck um a lot like glover um that i mean he's just the kind of person that you want good for you <laughs> even if you beat um even if you beat him you know he just beat you you want you're happy because of because he's such a great person. Uh, so anyway, that was a that was my story. The guy's name is Chris McCray. He he was the Ultimate Fighter uh, runner up season eleven, and uh, just I never forgot that that the way he, Court was crying. You know, he just won this unbelievable title through all of the shit he's been through in his life, and this guy's wiping Court's tears away, hugging him. And I'm like thinking, holy fish. So anyway, th- those are my probably two that come to the top of my mind. Those are cool stories for sure. You said earlier that as you were growing up, you know, it was all martial arts all the time. There was no space for other sports or other hobbies. And I'm wondering if in that time you were aware that you were so singularly focused uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of was. I mean, it's just to me, it's just what I did. I never really thought that much about it, yet that's all I thought about. You know, it's like so I didn't really think why I was thinking about it so much. It's just that was that was my life. You know, I mean, and and growing up in Hawaii, which is a very 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 tough tough state, probably the toughest state in the country. I mean, everybody can fight in Hawaii. I mean, it's like if you watch two guys that don't even train fight in the schoolyard you're thinking you're watching some kind of amateur, you know, high level golden gloves match or something. I mean, kids in Hawaii can fight. And, um, the way I was treated, um, in in my high school, I was treated like the, like the star quarterback for the football team. I mean, because I was a, I was a martial arts fighter. I was a golden glove boxer, um, the teachers, the principal, I mean, the the, uh, the administration, they treated me like I was one of the, the star. Like if I had to go fight, they would give me like breaks during this, you know, like that week. I mean, they would just, the teachers knew that I had to fight that week because it was in the paper. So they would like give me some leeway on my, on my attendance and stuff. I would walk around and all the football players would be sitting there and I'd walk by them and I got as much or probably more respect than they did as the, you know, even the the star players on the team because fighting and martial arts is so respected there. And by the time I hit high school, I was already, you know, state champ, et cetera, in, in martial arts and boxing. So I was so lucky. I was, you know, my teachers, you know, Hey, good fight last, you know, last, last night or last this weekend. And, or, Hey, we know you're going to be busy training. So, you know, if you don't make it to class, we'll mark you. We'll mark you here. You know, I mean, it's just, it was unbelievable. And it was a tough, tough place. I had to fight a lot. But I also have, I mean, I have more good memories than bad. But there was, you know, I mean, there was people that hated white people there. I mean, you know, racism in Hawaii, especially in the 70s, it was crazy, you know. Um, but I also, toughness was respected. Not money, not smarts, not looks. They don't care how much money you have if you, you know, or, you know, how smart you were. 
it's tough. Locals in Hawaii respect toughness. And, and so being a tough guy, and that's one reason I did go overboard on the toughness. Um, I was given the respect as, as anyone, you know, any local. So, um, I, I had a, you know, like I said, school for me was, I was, I was so lucky and my instructor was such a tough guy and he instilled that in us. Um, so I, I mean, I wouldn't trade a thing and, and that's just all I knew. I mean, I was a martial artist, you know, I, I did other things too. I went to college, I became a registered nurse, but I always thought of myself as a martial artist. I mean, I was in the army. I was a martial artist. I would go training at the boxing gym. I didn't think of myself as a boxer per se. I was a martial artist. So I've always been a martial artist and I don't, I don't, I've never really delved that deep into the psychology of it, but that's just all I've been, you know, still to this day at almost six years old. That's all I am now. Hmm. You know, it's interesting the the words that you're using there, I, I think a lot of times when somebody says only or all, they're saying it in a limiting way. But as I'm hearing you say it, it, it doesn't sound limiting. It sounds encompassing. And that just, that's an interesting way to phrase it, but it seems very appropriate for you, at least based on what we've heard from you so far today. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be like just, I mean, I'm only just yeah. singularly. Yeah. Just, that's just, the <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, that's that's how I look at myself and 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 that's how I look at a lot of people like uh you know, I mean some of the some of the guys people don't realize people in the UFC I mean a huge majority of them are martial artists first. I mean you watch the every every fight you see it. This last weekend guy knocks out uh um uh, he knocks out his opponent, uh, Barbosa Knocks him out cold with one knee. The guy's on the ground. He could have got three more shots in before the referee got there. And, and a lot of people do that. But he saw that he was out. And he just turned and walked away. He could have gotten three extra shots. You know, that's that's and that's what most Mar uh, MMA guys are. And it's it's becoming more and more like that. It was a lot rougher in the old days. They're they're a lot tougher than ever, but mentally these MMA guys aren't just athletes. They're martial artists and they know it and they carry, they, they carry that with them. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's one reason I'm so proud to be part of, of this whole, uh, generation. Why do you think that is shifting? You know, the, the respect, let's call it that that's coming in, in these full contact fights. I think a lot of reasons. I mean, I know people like me and Laborio and, 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 and like uh, a lot of the people at Jackson's uh, we're, we're coaches, but they know that we're martial artists and, and that they have to toe a certain line and, and things are going to be handled differently. Uh, an MMA fighter, a lot of them have wrestling backgrounds, which is also a martial art. So they use the word coach as a sign of respect, like a martial artist. Or karate guy would say sensei, but it's it's said with the same, uh, you know, with the same respect. Um, like Coach Hackleman, I get called Coach Hackleman um, a lot by everybody from Brian Sand to you know champions in the UFC, um, and and I think that has part of it. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know a lot of the coaches demand it whether they're a wrestling coach or, or they have a martial art background, like, you know, um, like uh, Anthony Perez, you know, I mean, just so many people are starting to do it. And it's becoming more and more the norm now. Like you got the Duke, Duke Rufuses that are straight up sensei. Um, you know, most of the schools are run like martial arts school. Most of the, Fight camps are run like martial arts or martial arts schools now. Mine always was, um, and mine was. You know, it, it's it's becoming the norm more than the exception now. Before it's like everybody had a tap out shirt and they had a cage in their gym and they did the opposite. They started to make it more like a fight gym and less than like a martial arts school. And people, I think, 
even the fighters, they're like, oh, I'm a martial artist. I want to be treated like one. I don't want to treat my the instructors like one. So, you know, since we don't do sensei, they do coach. Um, but it's, it's an unbelievable sign of, uh, sport of respect. Un- unlike any other, I mean, you don't see that. And, and, you know, I love football and I don't love it. I've never watched a football game, but I love the toughness of it. Um, the athleticism of basketball, but I mean, come on, this is, they're, they're, they're nothing like, like a martial arts they're nothing like mma it's just it's a whole different breed and the breed is starting to get so so much better now i mean in the old days it was you're good at uh, jujitsu and if you could get past the kickboxer and get him to the ground you're going to win every time or if you're a good kickboxer and you can stay on your feet you're going to knock out the jujitsu guy every time and then if you're a wrestler you know you can get the guy down that's all you need to do. You don't worry about a submission. I, it, there's nothing, none of that anymore. It's now, it's a new era, and everybody's good at everything now, and they they want to be known as martial artists, and and so they carry themselves like it for the most part. And you know, so well, sure, there are exceptions to every rule, and I think everybody that's trained in a traditional school knows that even within those four walls, there are people and. Unfortunately, sometimes even high-ranked people that don't carry that respect and that attitude through as they should. Yeah, that's true. Now, I'm going to yeah, guess. That, that's oh, very true. No, that's very true because, yeah. I mean, even if you look at the old Kaji Kempo, I mean, I mean, I look at it, you know, my, my instructor taught me toughness. I mean, my dad taught me respect and, and morality and a moral compass. My stepdad taught me um, to hang loose and to have fun and to work hard. Um, uh, my uh, high school counselor, Mr. Kadikaro, taught me to to be kind and look out for people and, and take care of people. And Godin, see, there's four people that shaped my life. But Godin, my instructor, taught me toughness. He's, he's without him, you know, the toughness wouldn't have been there. Um, uh, so I, I, I respect that. And Kaji Kempo guys were no, I mean, he spent, he spent, I don't know how many years, probably 15 years of his life in prison, you know, my instructor. Um, so I didn't get the moral compass from him. Um, I, I, but I did get the toughness from him, you know, the moral compass, I wouldn't have followed his, um, you know, but his toughness, I couldn't have lived like like I did, and I couldn't have persevered my life the way I did and accomplished things without that toughness. Just like the kindness I got from my counselor or the moral compass from my dad or the hard work ethic, um, but hang loose from my stepdad. Um, but Godin and, Go- you know, Kaja Kempo guys were known for the toughness. They weren't, you know, they weren't nice guys. They weren't Miyagi's. They were... You know, they they learned their art to beat up people on the street. I mean, so they did that. They got together in a, uh, you know, in a rec center and, and put their arts together, Kaju, Kempo, Karate, Judo, Jiu-Jitsu, Kempo, and Boxing, and they would train together so they could go beat up people in the street better, more effectively, and more efficiently. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, an art founded like some of the karates, they, you know, mythology, whatever it is, you know, they were being, you know, they were being taken over by evil um, soldiers, so they learned how to use their, you know, their farming farming tools as weapons, or you know, whatever whatever started that martial art. Kaju Kempo started to beat up people in the street, and so that's kind of the tough guy mentality. And it was a tough art, and it was very hardcore. Um, and and I I didn't love it at that time. But now I look back at it and I, I, I wouldn't trade a thing. Mm. Right on. So I don't know. I, I'm, I, I, like I said, I look back uh, and, and I love where I came from. I love how I persevered it. I loved, uh, you know, I love that I can, I look in the mirror, I look at, you know, what I've done and I, I feel nothing but pride. 
uh, for that part of it. A lot of things I wasn't proud of that I did in my life, but the martial arts, there's not too much that I'm not proud of. Now you've spent a lot of time. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of grit. I don't know that that's a word that you use, but it's one that's really coming to mind for me as I'm listening to the things that you're saying and the toughness. I mean, that, that attitude, one of the things in martial arts that I've always loved. And I think that a lot of people outside of the martial arts respect us for is that we have an ability to persevere through difficult times. You've talked about how tough it was growing up on Hawaii. You've talked about, you know, you've hinted at, at some of these challenges. I'm wondering if you might tell us about one of them, you know, a time in your life where things didn't go well and how your martial arts training helped you move through that. Uh, well, coming up, coming up, like junior, grade school, it wasn't that bad. I mean, I always hear it was going to be really bad. Uh, but even like sixth grade, I mean, wasn't that bad. And I didn't really go to a tough grade school, but the junior high school I went to was really tough. Um, and there weren't many whites. I, don't, I probably could count them on one hand. Um, and most of the whites were like surfer dudes that w would go to – most of the whites in my area went to private school. Or if they did go to public school, they stuck together and they were surfers or pot smokers and they did their own thing. And if a local looked at them, they'd look at the ground and they wouldn't you know, start anything. And I wasn't like that. Um, and I knew it wasn't going to be like that, and and so I did come across different different. Uh, and there was one guy at school that was a tough guy. Um, I don't know if he was the toughest guy at school, but he definitely was probably one of them. And um, you know, instead of being like looking down or giving him my quarter, which was lunch money at the time, um, I challenged him, not like challenged him to fight, but I challenged him by saying no when he asked me for my lunch money. I, you know, I looked at him back in the eyes and we started fighting just spontaneously. He started a fight with me in the cafeteria. This is like, you know, I think the end of seventh grade already. Um, and I was already at Godin's for a couple of years. And I was already starting to get some of the toughness that he's instilling in us even more mentally than physically, I think. Um, so I started fighting. So it got broken up real quick because it was in the cafeteria and this guy, um, he said, he, he you know, he's calling me F and Howley and, you know, we're going to fight again and I'm going to meet you at such and such bathroom at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. I'm going to kick your butt. And, and I was like, okay, I'll be there, man. I'll be there. You know, I was like, pound my heart's pounding. I was, you know, like most times when I acted tough, I was really trembling inside. And, um, all weekend, man, I was like hitting the bag and practicing what I was going to do on Monday. And um, so Monday come whatever time was, I met him at the bathroom. There was the back bath. I said, the our bathroom. If anybody's out there from Kamaki Intermediate, it was our bathroom. And they're all lettered. So this is R, like the letter R. And it was in the back campus near the bus stop. And that's more secluded. So that's why we met there. Um, and we met, and there was a crowd of people there. Everyone wanted to see um, – I don't want to say his name. I'm, uh, his first name was Daryl. I'll say Silva. It was, a it was a Portuguese last name, but it wasn't Silva, but I don't want to say his name. Um, but uh, So he met. We met at the bathroom, and a bunch of people are crowded in there. And, um, and um, so we went at it. And um, I remember going at it and, and kicked him. I remember kicked it. I remember kicking him really hard, and, and I remember some of the kids, his friends, obviously, were saying, "Hey, you can't kick!" And I was like, what? "Why? Why?" So anyway, I beat him up, and his nose is bleeding, and and then the 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 um the vice principal came in and broke it up, and and he was already I already won the fight, and obviously everyone knew that, and he's like. He wasn't saying, I want to fight you anymore, but they broke it up. And back then when, when you fight, I mean, he was bleeding all over the place and, um, I had won. And back then it wasn't like now if you get in a fight now in school, they send you to Guantanamo Bay and treat you like a terrorist and they have zero tolerance. And next thing you know, you're on, you're on, you're on, you're suspended from school and you're, 
the the freaking security of the United States. NSA is 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 like they're bugging your phone and your it's it's crazy. It's two boys fighting. They they've been doing it since there's been two boys. So anyway, um, we go back to our class. The teachers come get back to class. You know the the vice principal. Uh, probably brought us in his office and gave us a little swat in the butt like he always did with his paddle. And we went back to class. No big deal. Except nothing was ever the same again. Um, I never got treated the same by anyone after that day. And it just, it gave me a, the way people looked at me different and the way I felt myself different. I beat up like the toughest kid in school and now I'm the badass and I didn't have to look down when, when locals walked by me. Um, it was it was different. Everything changed from that day. Everything. The way I carried myself, the way I felt about myself, the way I trained. Um, and that was the turning point of everything. And it could have gone so many different ways. Like, I could have punked out and said, I don't want to fight you. I'm, I'm a punk. Or I could have lost the fight and at least fought him. That would probably get me a lot of respect. It would have. But I fought him and I beat him. I beat him bad. The only person that didn't like me after that fight was the, was the janitor because she had to clean up the blood and she never talked to me again. She used to always greet me. But I remember her coming in while we were being pulled out of the bathroom by the vice, vice principal. And she looked at the blood and looked at me like it was my fault. And she never talked to me again. <laughs> but anyway, so that was the, to me, that was one of the biggest turning points of my life. Wow. You know, when we, when we talk about something like this, when we talk about a fight, it's really easy as martial artists to hold that, that line that I don't know if I want to call it a cliche, but you know, don't fight, do everything you can avoid the fight. And you can do that in a moment, right? You can avoid that fight that time. But what do we always say? We say, you know, you avoid the fight unless you can't. And life is a lot bigger than that one moment. And that was the thing I was thinking of, putting myself in your shoes there. Because those of us that have grown up, those of us that were targeted at some point, know that, sure, you can you can dodge that fight, you can get out of it that time. But that doesn't mean that that challenge doesn't come up day after day. And it doesn't mean that those challenges don't become bigger and i don't and i don't think i don't think always avoiding a fight is always the best way to go i mean if you okay and now let me clarify that because as an adult it always is every single time there's it's always needs to be avoid avoided at all costs because to me an adult fight is self defense life or death but kids fights in school, to me, don't have to be avoided all the time. If one fight will get you from not being a bully target anymore, to me, it's worth taking it. And a, and a fight in, in school, in, in grade school with two kids, isn't a life or death thing. It's a, it's a fight. So it's, it's kids have been doing it their whole life. Girls gossip, boys fight. And that's just, I mean, it's in our DNA. And boys are always punished for the, doing stuff that's in their DNA. But um, yeah. But I don't know. So I, I I think you shouldn't ever start a fight. But in school, sometimes I think it's better to take that fight and then stop it. You know, stop the bullies from looking your way and going going somewhere else than always avoiding the fight. But in the street, as an adult, it's nothing. It's, I divide it into two separate uh, entities when I'm training my my students. There's schoolyard fights, and then there's street fights. Street fights are li- life and death, I think, um, for the most part. And you have to you have to treat them like such, or else, because then if your opponent thinks they are and you don't, um, it's going to turn out badly for you. And then if he doesn't and you do. It's going to turn out badly for both of you. But in the schoolyard, it's mainly schoolyard dominance. And you're just trying to see who's going to dominate the schoolyard. That day, I, I started 
that you know if it turned out differently it it, it would have um a lot of different scenarios but it didn't so um that one that one fight probably changed my life more than any other fight i ever had in or out of the the ring that one fight uh directed my course more than any other so i appreciate that i've tried to look for the guy when i go back to hawaii because i go back every year but every time i go he's like just went back to prison he's like i guess he was out for a while but he's back in i was i went even this last november uh and he was back in so i didn't get to see him i wanted to thank him personally what do you mean what what would you say say thanks you helped make me who I am, and I hope everything's great in your life. Doesn't look like it is, but um, just say thanks, you know. That's it. Thanks for, uh, you know, uh, thanks for him. You know, if it wasn't for guys like him and Godin and uh, and and Mr. Kadikaro, Mr. Ayet. Mr. Ayet is uh, one of my teachers that um, actually – was broke up one of the fights I got into in school. And I never, I wasn't a, I was not a smart ass. I wasn't a, a, a bragger. I wasn't anyone that picked on anyone. I never talked back to my teachers. I was respectful, but some guy, you know, called me an effing Howley and I kicked him in the head and we were in like 10th grade. And Mr. I yeah, broke it up. He was a P teacher. And he said, uh, what, what what happened? And the guy goes, well, this, this effing Howley just kicked me in the head. And he goes, he looked at me, he said, did you? And I said, yeah. He goes, why did you do that? And I go, because he called me effing Howley. And he looked at the guy, he said, do you call him a F? I'm, he didn't say effing, you know, but I'm not saying that word. But anyway, he said, did you call him effing Howley? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, you deserve, you deserve the thing. Keep playing. And so we just kept playing. And... I, I've been telling that story for so long, and now that was in 1975, maybe. And Mr. Ayet still comes to our black belt ceremonies. He's still around, and he tells that story to my students. So that's kind of funny. But anyway. <laughs> you've had quite the chance to work with some amazing people. I mean, you've talked about some of them just today, and I know it's a much deeper list. If you could train with someone that you haven't, they can be alive or dead. Who would that be? Hmm. Alive or dead, train with someone that I haven't. That Bruce Lee. It'd be Bruce Lee just because of his uh, his um, his genius when it came to martial arts. Nobody nobody knows if he could fight or not. Nobody cares. I don't care. He was a martial artist. Whether he could fight in a cage or a ring or that means nothing. But the way he he um, just his foresight. I mean, he was doing things in the sixties that nobody else was doing till MMA came around and he was doing it in the sixties. Um, he was, you know, he was a trailblazer. So he was to me the greatest martial arts mind ever. There are a lot of people out there that would, that would agree. And if anyone that has spent time reading his books, I think would definitely be on that list. Let's talk about competition and not, not MMA competition. Cause you know, we've certainly heard a lot about that. Were you ever part of what we would call traditional martial arts competition? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, Godin, my instructor, my instructor's name is Walter Godin. So I'm, when I say Godin, um, and he didn't like, he didn't like titles, but he was professor Godin and then he was master Godin, but he just liked his, we called him chief, um, all his students. Um, but anyway, um, he, he was more of a, just a street guy and, and we would enter tournaments. He didn't believe in weapons. He like, I wanted to do like size. That was my favorite weapon to, we never did them, but just to watch. So I don't know how to use them, but I was like, Hey chief, can, we, can I practice with size? He goes, what? You know, he would cuss a lot. Even when I was a kid, I mean, he was cussing at me when I was like 10 years old. Um, but he was saying, he would say, that's a waste of time. If you want a weapon, you get a roll of nickels, a knife, a baseball bat, or a gun. Anything else is a waste of time. And I was like, but it's cool the way they do it at the tournaments and stuff. And he would just F you or whatever, and he wouldn't let us. 
So we didn't get to do those uh, those kind of weapons. But sometimes we wanted to do tournaments like sparring, and he would let us. But then he would get mad at us if we lost. He would say, punch him in the face. And then when we did, we'd get disqualified. So it never worked out well. So most tournaments wouldn't let any of his students enter. So we didn't get to enter many tournaments. So until um, I was a teenager and I got to do full contact stuff, um, I wasn't really much of a traditional karate guy. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Favorite martial arts? Yeah, oh yeah. It's it would be a, uh, it would be um, the Karate Kid. The first one, I assume. The first one and and Rocky Three. Okay. So obviously we talk about the Karate Kid on the show a fair amount, but we don't talk about Rocky Three. Right? We've talked about a couple Rocky of them throughout. Through why why Rocky Three? Because. Um, because I had like a similar story when I uh, when I f- finished college and started making a little more money, uh, I started changing and you know living in the suburbs and uh, couldn't always make it to training on time. So I joined a uh, a neighborhood like health spa called Racquetball World. It was in Canoga Park, California, and it was like they had stairmasters and and racquetball and stuff. And I couldn't always make it to my ghetto gym and train and spar and, and you know, be real hardcore like like Rocky couldn't uh, or didn't. He started to remember getting kind of softer and mm, didn't train yeah. as hard. And um, so I, I thought I could get by with um, training at Racquetball World and running around the block of my suburbs instead of living in a lower end place. Um, and I fought some guy um, who just happened to have he was black and he had a mohawk like Mr. T (laughs) true story. Um, and I, I thought I just beat anyone and I was so cocky by then. And I was like, didn't, I feel like I didn't have to put in the training. I was training on a, I was training on a stairmaster instead of sparring every day and hitting the, in the bag and stuff. So I go in to fight him and, and, um, he beats me in the first round or second, second round and beats me up bad. And, um, I just remember just feeling so uh, helpless. Like this guy's punching me, and I was out of. I was already tired after the first round. I was like, I just realized, you know, I just I lost the eye of the tiger, you know. So I go back and I train really hard. I put on some bulk, and I I just started going back to train how I used to, and I challenged him to another to another fight. So we fought again this time in Honolulu, Hawaii, at the Neil Blaisdell Center. Um, and this time I knocked him out. So it was kind of like the Rocky story, you know, the Rocky three story, you know, plus he had the Mohawk and we ended up fighting a third time and I broke his leg. Um, but so we fought three times, but the way he beat me the first time and I was so like, I was, it was like Rocky three. So that, because I could identify with that, I love Rocky three. So it was Rocky three and Karate Kid. Great movies for sure. Now, neither of those movies are really known for any kind of martial arts choreography. You know, great, great films for the story, for the emotional content, I would say. But if we think of martial arts actors. I'm a very emotional guy, too. What's that? I'm a very emotional guy, too, by the way. Uh, I can tell. Absolutely. You're you're not a good thing. It's not always a good thing, but no, it's not. But, you know, like anything else, there's a there's an upside and a down. Yeah. And you'd be different. Your stories would be different if you weren't. But if we talk about martial arts actors, yeah, you know, you, is there anybody that you look at and say, that's the guy or, or gal? Um, yeah, probably, it would probably be, um, 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 um the, the Chinese guy, um, Jet, not Jet Li, but the one before him. Jackie Chan? Um, the, Jackie Chan, Jackie Chan, the one that does his own stunts. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, yeah, they would be him. And then his acting, he has a real acting prowess, too, with his comedic timing is so good. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it would be him. And uh, if it was just a straight-up choreography guy. I like Jackie, I like uh, Jet Li, too. But to me, like nowadays, I loved uh, Sleeping Tiger, 
the uh, uh, fighting ta- uh, whatever dragon. But um, those are just that, that's you could tell there's so much camera work there, and it's so much there's so much wires and so much you know there's so much you know computer stuff. I just like Jack. Jack Chan was old school. He was just he was yeah he was to me the the best. And I love the fact that he would live so uh, frugally. They would say he would even just wash his own underwear when he went on the on the road, and and you know in the in he would wash his own clothes in the in the sink of his hotel and hang it up on the shower because he was so frugal. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Anyway, I don't know. I don't even know why I brought that up. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before, but I I can see it. I think there's. You know, when when you think about people that start from a little and they they're focused, they drive, they all tend to have some kind of abnormality in the way that they approach their life. Some and it usually comes out of necessity. You know, he, maybe he was spending his money instead of on you know going to the laundromat, he was spending that money on well, probably not acting lessons, but you know what I mean, just something. There was a reason for it, and he's just carried it forward. Could be. Could be. Are you a reader? Are there martial arts books that resonate for you? No, I'm a I'm a big reader. I read a lot of books. Um, and if my wife was here right now, she'd be lo- dying laughing because she doesn't count it as reading because I buy them on Audible.com and listen to them. <laughs> um, I count it, but I have like there's hundreds of them. Um, but. Um, but uh, to me, I read them. I mean, I listened to them, but I read them. So whatever. And no, the only martial art one I skimmed over um, was uh, the you know the Tao of uh, you know Bruce Lee's movie Tao of Jeet Do. But um, but I skimmed over it. I I didn't really find it the best reading. I tried to do the the, the um, and I have it. The Art of War. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest. Um, I've tried so hard to intellectualize it and uh, to become like that guy, the karate. You know how many karate guys? We have a karate guy down the street. I call it laundromat karate. It has a name, but I just call it laundromat karate because it's right next to a laundromat. But he's like one of these guys. He's one of them. And I just thought of it because – like the art of war, they, they they speak like they're like old Chinese philosophers. It's like you're like not even Asian. Stop it! But I don't know. I, I tried to listen to that, I read that book, and it just it didn't resonate for me. It didn't really make sense to me. It was like too esoteric, and it wasn't. It was trying to be too. I don't know, philosophical instead of being real. So I, I tried to read some of those books and stuff, but maybe I'm a little more pragmatic or maybe just stupid, but they don't really make much sense to me. And I always find like, uh, I don't know. I always just find them to be a little, and I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of religious. I believe in God, but it's like the Bible. It's like when I read the, I've tried to read the Bible. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. And then when people talk about it, I don't think it makes sense to anyone, but then some people pretend it does. So it makes them seem more intelligent. I don't know if that made sense. It does. It does. And, and first off, I don't think anybody out there, at least they shouldn't be calling you stupid. You've, you've had quite the career and stupid people don't have the career that you've had, but that's why I phrase the question the way I do. You know, there are lots of martial arts books out there. Some of them are exactly what some people need. Yeah. Maybe others are what other people need. Some people don't take information in in that way. I'm like yeah. you. I get a lot more out of listening to a book. You know, I'm able to hone in on not just the words, but the intent, the tone that comes through. And that works better for me. But not every martial artist is going to get what they want or need from martial arts books. Others swear. Yeah. So it's 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 not it's not a right or wrong for sure. And that's why we talk about it because it leads to some conversation for sure. Yeah. Now you haven't stopped. You know, I don't even know that you've slowed down at this point. Would you would you say that you have? 
you know, at this point in your career with what you're doing? Wow. That's, that's deep. But I, cause I could think of it so many different angles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've slowed down a lot. I've okay. slowed the, the, the thing I've slowed down is sparring. Um, every, the training, no, just as much, maybe even more conditioning just as much. Um, the karate martial arts training just as much. But the sparring I've slowed down for a lot of reasons, but but that one I don't. I just to me I'm, I'm a different role now. I don't want to do. I don't like to spar anymore. Um, so that's. I mean, that would be the only part that I'd say I really slowed down on. Okay. Now, if you're still going, if you've even ramped up some of these things, it's because you're. You know, there's still something driving you. I would guess. You know, and it may be as simple as this is who you are. This is. I mean, you, you talked about it pretty succinctly early on. You are a martial artist, but are there goals? Is there, is there stuff that you're working towards? Uh, um, yeah, yes and no. I always put little silly goals. Like I want to gain a little, like right now I'm on a gain. I was lost a little too much weight. I got a little too thin. I thought, so I wanted to put on weight and it was like hard for me, but then I did. Um, so I just played little games like that. Cause what else? I mean, at my age, when I want to try to win a title or, you know, I've done the CrossFit games a couple of times and that, that didn't really, I didn't really like that as much anymore. Just cause it's so different from what we do. Um, but, um, yes and no, not really. I mean, I just want to, I want to be in great shape. Um, I want to feel good. I want to, I want to be productive. I want to change lives. And to do that, you know, I got to train every day. I get up. I put this is okay. Talk about stupid. This is me. Seriously. <laughs> I actually put my gi on my gi with my belt. And then I go train outside on my, cause I have a, well, I have three acres. I have a whole gym. I mean, it's been, it's been a sports illustrated. It's been on you know, like ESPN. It's been on like almost every channel. So it's not just a backyard. It's my backyard gym, which has, you know, been all over the, you know, it's been, you know, it's pretty famous, but, but still my backyard. So I put my gi on and I train by myself, but with a gi on. And like my wife will look at me. She's like, she, she doesn't even say anything anymore, but she's like, in her mind, she's thinking, why, why, <laughs> what are you doing? And sometimes I think that too. But I do it anyway because it's just like I'm just used to it. I put my gi on and I go out and train. My neighbors must think I'm crazy because sometimes I'm like on the street pushing a wheelbarrow with uh, you know with my gi on. And people are probably thinking, this guy has lost it. But anyway, so that's what I still do. You know, I, I'm I'm gonna guess, and maybe maybe you're you're not even thinking of it that way, but I'm sure there's there's a reason in there somewhere. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe it's maybe it's comfort. You know, I, I don't when I do forms, when I do martial arts, I'm for, far more comfortable. I'm far more tied in to my decades of practice doing it when I'm wearing a uniform. You know, dobaki, whatever, whatever I'm doing. It just it it lines everything up for me energetically. You know, I'm a different person, and and to be perfectly honest, I am a I'm a better person when I'm wearing a gi, then I am wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I just feel better. Maybe it's the same for you. I don't know. Yeah. Well, my, my gi pants never come off. Um, except if I go out. So my gi pants, I wear 90, probably 98% of the time. Um, and that's why they have gis with pockets now. Right. That sent for me. Yeah. They made those for me. <laughs> it's the first thing I was thinking of when you said you wore them so much. I'm not joking. They actually made those for me. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they actually made those for me. Um, so yeah, Mike Dillard, the owner of Century. Yeah, he actually said we're over, we we're hanging out once, and uh, he's actually a good friend of mine. And he's like, "Do you you don't ever take care of your gi?" And it's like, and I wear a fanny pack. And he goes, "You should, it would be easier if you had pockets." I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Okay." And next thing I know. He sent me a pair of uh, gi pants with pockets. Now they sell them, so I was pretty happy. So you you were the one. 
You were the yeah. one that inspired that. That's good to know. And so, they have they have jeans that the, these these uh, Chuck Norris jeans. Yeah. That um that are more I mean just as comfortable as any gi, and you can kick, you can train in them. They're unbelievable. I they're my favorite jeans in the world. So if I'm not wearing a gi, I'm wearing my Century kicking jeans. <laughs> they come back around every I don't know. It's like five to eight years. They they update them and and do them again. And and I've had a chance to talk to a couple of people who have the latest iteration, and they just they really dig them. Yeah, I love them. But you know, it's just that's fun because we have a lot of instructors that listen to the show. So all of you instructors that wear your martial arts uniform, whatever variant that is, and it has pockets in the pants. Here's the man that you have to thank. If it wasn't for Mr. You're John welcome. Hackleman, You're welcome. you would have to but, be wearing a fanny pack or putting stuff on a shelf. But I still wear my fanny pack because it has become, you know, an, an accessory. I mean, those are two things that I don't really need, um, a fanny pack and a watch because, you know, you, but I, I'll always wear a watch. I'm a huge watch guy. And, um, and I always, not always, but I almost always wear my fanny pack. They also, Lululemon now, let me just tell you guys out there, Lululemon now makes fanny packs. Um, so I've been waiting for that day for a couple of years now, and they finally have started making uh, fanny packs. So for all you guys out there, uh, Sentry has geese with pockets, and Lululemon makes fanny packs. So I mean... How much better can life be? <laughs> I don't know. And you know, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell things that maybe I'm not supposed to tell, but we have had multiple high ranking, well respected, you know, internationally known martial artists on the show that I have seen, met in person, that carry their things in a fanny pack. So I'm not saying that you have to get a fanny pack to become, you know, a tenth on grandmaster well known, but it may help. <laughs> it sure as hell won't hurt. I'll That's just right. put it that way. That's right. <laughs> All right. Now you've got a lot going on. This is kind of what we call I mean we call it commercial time. You you may have a different angle for it, but if people wanted to get a hold of you, if you know they wanted to support what you've got going on, you know, if you're on social media, any of that, let us know what's up. So people can, can send some love your way. Um, I am actually doing some martial arts training online. The pit online dojo is, that's probably the hub for everything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm big on social media, pit underscore masters, my Twitter and my Instagram, but you can get everything on, 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 uh, the pit online dojo. If you can't remember all that, it's too complicated, or it's too long, and you, you couldn't figure that one out. Just the pit.tv, like television, and you can get, it brings you to it brings you to that site. Okay. So that's what I do, and I'm doing an online membership um, where people can train with me. I just put my same curriculum that I'm giving my students, that I'm teaching my students every week. I put it online, and I'm also starting. I also videoed my first one. It's being edited. I'm doing self-defense um, courses because my number one goal in life in life is everybody stays safe and healthy. And there's only two ways to do that is to prevent yourself from getting killed from someone in the street or hurt badly. Or number two, die of some terrible disease that you could have prevented if you were healthy. So safe and healthy to me are the two uh main things in life. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a self-defense seminar, so I'll keep you safe. And then uh, you can take care of the healthy, the fitness part on your own. Yeah. Okay, cool. Do you have any parting words of advice for the people that have been listening today? Yeah, I think everybody should train hard. Uh, live clean and fight dirty. Don't let anyone take your lunch money. And I think you got to remember whether you like it or not and what kind of whatever your martial art is, 
you have to remember that 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 there's mean whether you, you know whether you want to like it or not there's mean evil violent people in the world and the only there's only one way to beat them the only way to beat them is to be better at violence than they are and that's the only way to beat them if this was your first experience with Mr. Hackelman i'm guessing he's left you entertained and wanting more he has some great online resources you should check out, and those, as well as his social media links and some photos, are in the show notes. Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. Thank you, Mr. Hackelman, for coming on the show. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram with the username Whistlekick. Have you left us a podcast review yet? If not, I'd really appreciate that. You can do it on iTunes, or if you get your podcast somewhere else, how about there? Before you put on another martial arts event, make sure you read the book we've put together and consider the course. I will personally promise you'll make more money using these strategies. Find the book on Amazon and the course is at KarateTournamentBook.com. Thanks for listening today. Until our next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day.